The COVID-19 pandemic's taken a mental toll on just about everyone, especially medical staff. Remember at first when we were cheering just about every night, banging pots and pans, cheering on those frontline workers? Well, then we went to cheering maybe once a week, but then the cheers kind of faded away and the infections kept spreading. Now, to heal the sick, we look to doctors. But who heals them when the mental strain of a pandemic stretches months, then years on end? In this episode, we'll hear from Dr. Camelia Adams. She's studying the mental health of Saskatchewan physicians in this pandemic. And a bit later on, we'll hear from Angie Weeb. She's one of the psychologists with the University of Saskatchewan Employee Assistance Program. That's all just ahead, here on Researchers Under the Scope. Hi, I'm Jen Cannell. The first guest today we recorded in my backyard here in Saskatoon on Tuesday, July the 13th. Her name's Dr. Camelia Adams. She's an associate professor in the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Psychiatry. And up till the pandemic hit, she was running the Attachment Research Lab. Well, when everything shut down, Dr. Adams' focus shifted. And that's where she joins us to pick up the story today. Hello there, Camelia. Hi, Jen. So back in March of 2020, what started to go through your head? Well, back in March of uh, last year, I think we were really faced with an unprecedented challenge. We've seen other epidemics before, but the uh, speed of spreading that we were witnessing, like Italy, we were looking at New York, uh, people dying, physicians being challenged and not knowing what to do. And we started wondering what's going to happen to us and when we're going to be next. I remember the very last department meeting that we had in person in the East Lecture Theater. And one of our colleagues who just returned from China told us the picture there. So his mother just died in one of the hospitals that was overwhelmed with COVID infections. And she wasn't actually given the proper treatment because of that. So we were really faced with the real atrocities out there. We wondered what's going to happen next. We were asked to work from home and we kind of lost connection with each other. There was no clear communication of what's going to happen. So that, that, that was a bit of a paralyzing anxiety, not knowing what's going to happen next. As it turned out, in a matter of I would say days, people kind of came up with solutions. So we started to get in touch with each other. We developed several chat groups for our small outpatient psychiatrist group, for the department. We started to have town halls where we would be kind of glued to the screen to see, you know, what's going to happen next, what is the plan. And when the initial panic kind of subsided, each of us started to look for some sort of solution, like what's what's our individual role given the positions we each had what can i do what can i control do yeah what can i do and and the truth is that we each faced different kind of challenges you know there there was a difference between an inpatient psychiatrist and an outpatient psychiatrist outpatient psychiatrists could see patients over a video or have a session over the phone an inpatient psychiatrist had to go in to wear a full protective equipment and uh, have a higher risk of exposure so there were absolutely you know kind of different challenges according to the specialty so i, I really started to wonder how are we really facing this coping with this responding to this Um, each of us. How did you go about getting the data for your research on this? So I sat down and I thought about all the possible emotional conditions, uh, the distress that uh, physicians might face uh, during this hard times according to their specialty. So I, I came up with a long survey screening for a variety of mental health conditions, but also looking at coping styles, you know, things that would uh, help them remain resilient in the face of adversity. And we developed this great survey. My colleagues, Miriam and Twee, helped me develop all the questions in red cap. So it was something that would be by email and physicians would access it through a link and have time to complete it. But it was long. It was taking about 25 to 30 minutes. 
And in short time, I got back only nine completed surveys and several emails telling me that's far too long for very busy physicians who are working overtime during this pandemic. So uh, after all that effort, we had to start from scratch. We had to reduce everything to seven to 10 minutes. That meant that a lot of the very, you know, respected valid symptom skills, we had to eliminate and replace them with an open question. Something like, uh, has your mental health changed during the pandemic? Like how, uh, was it worse, better, same as before? Has your sleep changed? Has your physical health changed? So we got some big questions like this, but we also got some specific uh, scales on uh, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, trauma-related disorders such as PTSD. So we were able to get a glimpse into some of the possible uh, symptoms related to this, but also coping styles employed. And so the second version of the questionnaire that went out It went to every single doctor in Saskatchewan, didn't it? Yes, yeah. We sent it again. I personally contacted all the department heads, provincial heads of all the departments. I even asked SMA and they posted it in their newsletter. So efforts have been made to to reach everyone. Luckily, we got back 118 answers, completed surveys that we're currently analyzing to prepare for a publication. Saskatoon and Regina had more answers, so probably they're a bit overrepresented, but I'm happy to say that people from all over the province did answer. So I'm so curious, what did the doctors tell you? More than 30% of of, uh, the doctors surveyed were unable to visit family or friends because of the COVID-19, so they were kind of affected in their personal lives. Uh, 7% of them lost someone close uh, Mm. due to COVID. About 70% of them, so kind of more than two-thirds, admitted that their emotional health was worse during the pandemic compared to before the pandemic. More than a third had symptoms of major depressive disorder, and uh, almost a third had symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder. Oh, my. And these were, you know, valid scales. Like, this number were significantly higher than what you see in the general population, for instance, the depression general population has uh, is about 7% and anxiety about 2.9%, so somewhere between 7 to 10 times more than general population, however, was comparable with physicians from other countries. Going through the pandemic. Going through the pandemic. Now, surprisingly, we got a lower than expected percentage of trauma-related disorders. So PTSD in our doctor population was only 3.7%. Uh, study in New York on a healthcare worker was somewhere around 60%. Oh, okay. That's hugely different. That's hugely different. And there are several possibilities. One is that the way we asked the question was strictly related to PTSD due to COVID alone, rather than PTSD. PTSD in general. Gotcha. Um, uh, So physicians admitted to struggling. All of them admitted to working longer hours than before. And people would mention things like 80 hours a week, like an unbelievable amount. So basically from the moment they woke up to the moment they went to bed, there was a lot of faith uh, in science to find answers and an amazing appreciation for the discovery that we can come together like people were describing very much the collegiality that kind of surfaced uh, during this time and it was a a nice feeling that several of them kind of reiterated Hmm. looking at those 118 doctors right from across saskatchewan were there any themes that came up with certain specialties really had it worse or people in intensive care for example like they were really showing signs of anxiety or depression more than more than others it's interesting you ask that because this was one of my original questions when I saw how uh, my colleagues in different specialties were facing different risks. And I was wondering about that. That's why we even collected data according to specialty. Interestingly, mental health and physical conditions appear to be similarly distributed in physicians with either high level of COVID exposure as well as those with low level of COVID exposure. Wait, it's even? Even. Even. Absolutely the same. Um, 
So, so basically kind of signifying rather universal impact of the pandemic on all specialties. Huh. Yeah. And, and I, I would say that some of the individual interviews that I had with doctors for the qualitative part of this study supported that. Like doctors felt prepared mentally and not particularly scared of facing this. They felt like they were trained to do this. But that was still not comparable to places like New York or Italy. So we, we were a little bit more fortunate here. Good. And we had time to prepare a bit better in terms of PPEs and... It was very interesting to see the very adaptive coping styles that physicians report. As I would say the majority of physicians report a very healthy ways of dealing. So people were able to feel more grounded by rediscovering their value system, their systems of faith, relationships with family and friends and colleagues. Becoming closer to them. Becoming closer, finding strength in what's, uh, what's important and, and meaning. Also, a lot of behavioral approaches like, uh, you know, resorting to discipline and exercise and healthy eating, healthy lifestyle. So uh, it was kind of impressive to see resorting to science to find hope. Uh, Science might have good answers and and, uh, just relying on uh, the capacity for mankind to come together and find a solution, which is probably what scientists uh, and and people in similar professions do in times like this. But these coping strategies, yeah, you could definitely see themes in them, whether it's I need to exercise more, I have to prioritize time with my family or perhaps my spiritual beliefs. Yeah, Yeah, I need to stay strong. I need to remain resilient uh, because if I am strong, I can help those around me. Hmm. Um, Now, one interesting thing if I should mention out of 118 physicians who completed the surveys, only one reported using professional help. Just one? Just one. What does that tell you? It speaks volumes to me. It suggests a rather self-reliant attitude, so that might have benefits, like taking personal responsibility for well-being, but some downsides as well. Either being unable or afraid to ask for help when needed. Mm. If you are a doctor in Saskatchewan, no matter what your specialty or field of practice is, are there consequences to your license, to being able to practice your career if you seek help for a mental disorder? It shouldn't be. The way we are maintaining our license every year, we have to uh, answer questions and we have to be honest about anything that might impact us in terms of our profession, of course, because we are responsible for uh, other people's lives and well-beings. It's an honor system. However, I always educate my patients and my colleagues know this, and we are all in favor of people asking for help when they need it because nobody should be discriminated based on medical reasons in any profession, and that includes a medical field. So when we're relying on doctors to use the honor system in declaring, yes, I do have something that will affect patient care, or no, I perhaps I have sought mental help this year, but it will not affect my patients. I, I can kind of sort out the different parts of my life. It is okay to say, yes, I've sought mental help, but no, it's not affecting my patients, and to answer that with a no? I, I would... I would say yes, as long as people take care of their health and they remain functional and adaptive, there is absolutely nothing wrong about being proactive about your own health and well-being. You can do it. A doctor can do it. It's, it's not a sign of weakness to seek that mental help? There is no sign of weakness. I see it as a sign of strength. Being honest, being courageous about your difficulties, that shows self-reflection, that shows integrity, that shows honesty. We're not invulnerable, and it's a false image to claim to be invulnerable. So um, I I do see physicians in my practice, and they're excellent professionals that I highly respect, and I like to believe that if I was in trouble, I can trust my other colleagues to to take care of me. And this doesn't erode our respect for each other and trust in in each other's competence. So it doesn't make you somehow less competent. No, not at all. 
not at all. It's, uh, it's, it's just uh, honesty about who we are. We are humans. We are not robots claiming to be perfect. We are just human beings trained to help other human beings. Well, that sort of leads me to what comes next for all this research that you've now put together between the questionnaires, between the interviews that you did. Where are you hoping this goes? I'm I'm seeing two two sides to it. Uh, one is in learning about physicians in the face of uh, challenging times like this. We learned about any people that are facing major risk, you know, in terms of catastrophe. It's not just physicians, but in seeing what works and what doesn't, we learn what to support, what to prevent. If we see very adaptive coping styles, then we should better be prepared to support those because they would be important. And uh, if we see vulnerabilities that we try to hide, hide under the carpet, maybe we should just become more honest about it and be open to it. Because let's spell out, what are the consequences of pushing things under the rug too long? Well, I think that they were they would uh, come back to hurt us later on and probably at a larger scale. In my experience as a psychiatrist, hiding a problem never helps. Being honest about it uh, and just facing it and finding solutions before it's too late is probably the best approach uh, most times. So that's where this research goes, is looking at the next pandemic, the next catastrophe, the next time we have to really push our doctors, there are things we can do to better support them. And it's not even uh, limiting to pandemics because the profession itself is a chronic challenge for many of us. So I would say if we learn to uh, foster resilience and honesty and support, we will have a better society overall. I think that's everyone's hope. (laughs) Thank you so much for talking with us today. It was a pleasure to be here, Jen. Thank you so much for the invitation. Dr. Camelia Adams is an associate professor in the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Psychiatry. She's also a practicing clinician at Royal University Hospital here in Saskatoon. Next up, we're going to check in with Angie Weed. Now, she's a psychologist who has spent the past six years working with the University of Saskatchewan's Employee Assistance Program. And we met up virtually in April. Hello, Angie. Welcome to Researchers Under the Scope. Hi, Jen. Thanks very much for having me. So there's been this pandemic. Yes. Um, what has the past year been like in terms of just even the volume of calls to the EAP from faculty and staff at the U of S? Well, Jen, we haven't necessarily found much change in the volume of our intake calls. It's remained approximately the same this last year. However, we're certainly seeing a shift in the way that clients are presenting as well as the concerns that they currently have. What kind of shift? Well, one of two things appears to be happening. So either the issues that were present prior to the pandemic are no longer of concern, or Hmm. the issues seem to be exacerbated by the pandemic. So for example, Uh. given the vast majority of USASC employees working from home right now, individuals that were struggling with stress specific to the workplace such as you know interpersonal conflict or workplace harassment those kinds of things they're no longer faced with those issues being at home right right yeah all the office stress is now well it's gone exactly yeah but on the other hand of course personal issues are magnified because individuals are working from home including their family members right so everyone's home far more now than ever before and this can create a little bit of a pressure cooker situation when there isn't the ability to get that reprieve or distraction that being in the workplace can offer you can't really get away to the office type thing that's exactly it yeah yeah and so that that work home life balance can be particularly difficult right now it has felt like we've been stacked on top of each other quite a lot on the home front over the past year and what are the sorts of emotions and situations that people are calling most often about? Well, especially early on in the pandemic, what we were seeing was a lot of difficulty struggling to balance that work and home life. It was a big 
and very steep learning curve for people initially as work moved into the home realm and kind of overtook the home space. So there was someone that I was working with in particular uh, that comes to mind and she was having a lot of difficulty vying for space and privacy in her home because there were other family members that were working and studying from home. Right. She was used to having the commute to wind down from work. And so part of that winding down would be the parking in the garage, the closing the car door at the end of the day. And that initiated the transition from professional space to that personal space, the home life, where she could then begin rituals, routines, and practices that moved her into her personal realm. Well, and it kind of makes sense, right? You move from, okay, you're professional, then you you hang up the phone, you turn off the Bluetooth, close the car door, and in you go, take a deep breath, because here's your second shift as the human who lives with other people at home. Exactly. Yep. And so without having clear boundaries established, she was at a loss and she found it really difficult to compartmentalize that personal from the professional, right? And so then that puts strain on relationships. Her work hours were no longer defined. So she'd be working right up until bed with, you know, the laptop and emails very readily available. And likewise, with family around constantly during the day, she had difficulty focusing exclusively on work during the traditional work hours. Ugh. What what do you do in a situation like that? Well, the work that she and I did together was to establish new routines and practices in order to better set parameters around both work and home life. Parameters. What kinds of examples of things could she change? Like, do you go for a walk as you switch your shift or exactly. do you find a different place to work in the house? Yeah. And so I've had lots of these kind of strategizing conversations with people. So um, generally would start with a waking ritual. You know, what does your morning routine kind of look like? You know, getting dressed as if they were headed to the office, making lunch, getting that coffee ready, possibly even going for a drive around the block to kind of mimic that commute, that workday commute, right? Mm-hmm. Um, some other things were closing office doors to set that very visible boundary around right. availability to family members throughout the day, right? You know, this is, you know. I am at work. Close that door. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Do not disturb. Don't interrupt, Right. As you mentioned, taking regularly scheduled breaks for things like lunch or for a walk just to get outside to get some fresh air and to build some movement in during the day. Um, And then at the end of the day, things like closing the computer and maybe closing the door on that office space if they, you know, have office space established to make the end of the day, right? That, that door is closed. I don't go in there anymore. I don't just go check and see if that one more email came in. That's right. Hmm. I'm guessing she's not alone in facing like this wide range of weird emotions and situations we've never been in before. And I want to touch on one of the words you mentioned there, vulnerability and being vulnerable. What might our listeners, especially our biomedical researchers and our scientists, what do we need to keep in mind there? Yeah, it's interesting because this group of people aren't necessarily any different than the rest of the population. So some of the things that my team and I have witnessed are feelings of fear, overwhelm, stress, and even burnout. However, I think predominant emotion that we're seeing is one of vulnerability. So people are experiencing vulnerability around relationships and around an overall sense of safety and security and even vulnerability around life and existence. It feels like almost every decision is the wrong one. Yeah, and so we're seeing things um, like people struggling to make decisions, people losing confidence in themselves, um, you know, even having a sense of insecurity, having some self-doubt where maybe they hadn't previously. This is new. Well, and we have such talented high achievers, especially in biomedical research. And I wonder for high achievers, no matter what your field is, why is it sometimes so hard to to dial that EAP number? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's still so much stigma around mental health. So as a society, we're generally getting better at acknowledging and accepting mental health for other people. 
but to ask hmm. for help and accept it still can imply weakness for many. For some, it can be embarrassing and even shameful for high achievers to admit that they need help, right? These are an extremely resourceful group of people. They're used to exceeding expectations, right? They yeah. can be perfectionistic and even compulsive when achieving that excellence in, in academics and, and academic rigor. So this is a group of people who are very adept problem solvers, and they're used to figuring things out often on their own. And I think that's why it can be so difficult to ask for help sometimes. Yeah, it's not typically been their role. They've been the ones who succeed. And yep, uh, mental health, that's good. Other people can take care of theirs. It'll never be a problem for me sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's also a vulnerability that goes along with that, right? Reaching out to essentially a perfect stranger to divulge deeply personal and private stuff. Mm. Well, and especially if I look at the biomedical people, the hospital clinicians who have dual roles at the U of S and in the hospital, some of them are really stressed right now. And what are the signs that mm, it maybe is time to take that step and make the call? Yeah, that's going to vary for each individual. But generally speaking, if a person is experiencing emotions or behaving uncharacteristically, if you know you're feeling a decreased capacity for coping and for resilience in general or a sense of isolation or loneliness those can be signs um, for many people they're encouraged by a loved one you know someone in their in their life is saying you know i think it's time to go talk to someone right mm. and for other people they might just have an instinct that it's it's time it's time to reach out and ask for help well, yeah. And if I don't take care of this now, things just, they're not just getting better by now. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you can have a first session with a counselor, see if they're a right fit for you. And I always give people the option when I meet with them, that if I am not the right fit for them to try somebody else, because in my opinion, I have a bias. I believe that that's the most important part about counseling is that relationship. That's going to be just as important as, you know, the work that gets done in, in some respects. This is really good information to have. And Angie, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about it today. Thank you so much for having me, Jen. I appreciate it. Angie Weeb is a psychologist with the University of Saskatchewan's Employee Assistance Plan. And if anything you've heard on today's episode kind of touches a nerve, the EAP at the University of Saskatchewan is here for you. In Saskatchewan, you call 306-966-4300. They have free 24-7 confidential support. Researchers Under the Scope is a presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. We record and produce this podcast on Treaty 6 territory, and we acknowledge that we live and work on Treaty 6 territory, which is also the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, reaffirming our relationship with one another. Thanks for sharing your ears with us today. I'm your host, Jen Cannell. Once again, that EAP number, 306-966-4300. And if you haven't hit follow or subscribe yet, Go ahead, give that button a push and that way you'll always be up to date on the latest Researchers Under the Scope.